Welcome to Parrot Literary Corner. My name is Muti Olawi, and on the show with me today, as usual, I have my co-host, Dustin Pickridge. Say hi to the uh, to our viewers at home, please, Dustin. Hello, subscribe to the channel. It's a great channel. Thank you. Um, and today we are having a very unique writer, a creative mind par excellence. And who is this person, um, as we have posted earlier, we have uh, Troy Kamplin. Say hi to our viewers at home. Hello. Yeah, yeah um, that's um, Troy. Troy, before we <laughs> go deeply into the exploration of your literary and creative world, we would like to have you introduce yourself to our viewers. All right, um, really quickly, I guess. Uh, I have a pretty eclectic background. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in South Bend, Indiana, but raised in rural Kentucky and um, raised in a fundamentalist Baptist church. Went on to uh, Western Kentucky University to major in recumbent gene technology and minor in chemistry. I, um, where I kind of switched up a lot of my worldviews, to say the least. Um, I went ahead and got a master's, oh, well, I didn't get a master's degree. I almost got a master's degree in molecular biology before I decided I was bored and decided to do creative writing instead. So after a year of English classes, I got into a master's program at the University of Southern Mississippi, um, where I got to work with uh, Rick Barthelme, a minimalist novelist, and then I went to UT Dallas to work on my PhD in the arts and humanities, where I got to work with uh, Frederick Turner, um, who is a formalist poet. And so um, my poetry when I was, um, before I came to UT Dallas in 2000, my poetry was mostly free verse. Um, there were some rhythm sort of sneaking in, but it was mostly free verse. And after Fred Turner, uh, things changed <laughs> quite a bit. Um, it took me a while to learn how to write in iambic pentameter. That took mm. years. <laughs> but uh, once I got it down, um, uh, things started flowing in, in some very interesting ways. And uh, now since then, I've uh, written several plays, one of which uh, won a Playwriting Festival Award. Um, I've also written a work of philosophy called Diaphysics and a novella uh, by the title of Hear the Screams of the Butterfly. So, you so and Hear the Screams, the screams of the Butterfly. Well, That's very impressive. So over to you, Dusty. Quite a, quite a uh, bio. Yeah, I was going to ask about Hear the Screams of the Butterfly since um, my, my press, Transcendent Zero Press, published the novella and I, I thought very highly of it. I, under Undercurrents of mythology in there. And I wondered, other than the surface, you know, meaning of the of the um, novella, is there an under, underlying theme you're exploring using that mythology? Well, I mean, I use a, I use mythology quite a bit in in all of my mm -hmm. works, actually. Um, the The great thing about mythology is is that um, there are these underlying archetypes that we we very quickly and easily relate to, um, even if we're not entirely familiar with with the particular myth. We we feel that 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 connection to that story. And, and oftentimes too, if, if you are familiar with the myth, just a mention can pull into your mind an entire story, an entire set of stories, a, a set of interconnections. And I think one of the things that I think literature does, great literature does, is that it, it taps into these archetypes and it, it makes these connections amongst uh, other works of literature, other stories, um, not even necessarily literature per se, but it might tap into, um, you know, children's stories, um, 
any anything that's sort of familiar to us. Um, and again, mythology really really does that for us in sort of a big way. And so I would say that a lot of the mythology uh, um, then for that for the character for the main character uh, Patrick, the mythology sort of helps to show sort of how wide ranging his thinking is, how complex his thinking is, how, um, I mean, he is in a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And so the part of it too is how much of this is real to him. See what I mean? Right. That how, how much are the gods, are these images real to him and how much is not how much is is intended as metaphor mm. and so one of the things i'm trying to do is sort of blur so those kind of lines blurring illusions with reality sort of to sort of indicate his his mental states and uh it, that i found it fascinating because it really captured um a lot of the um flow of the narrative I think that was it was an excellent story, and for those listening, um, that is available on Amazon. If anybody wants to pick up a copy of that, it's a wonderful book. Um, and so, further on, you know, um, you mentioned Frederick Turner, and I was wondering, um, you know, could you tell us a little bit about him, a little bit, and how he affected your writing more, a little bit more in depth about that? Uh, yes, uh, Frederick Turner is a really fascinating uh, individual. Um, his father was Victor Turner, who was a world famous anthropologist. Um, his his brother um, was the co inventor of the MRI. <laughs> mm. uh, Fred Turner uh, grew up in Africa um, mm. with a tribe that his father was studying, um, and and played with those kids and was very much you know integrated in into the. The tribe that they were studying, and then uh, he, when they went back to England, he went to college at, at Oxford, <laughs> and so he has a very interesting sort of background there. Um, he, he said that he'd always wanted to be a poet. Mm. Um, his poetry is uh, mostly formalist, like I said, and he has written three science fiction epic poems, um, and. You know, for what she's uh, somewhat, you know, well known for, and so he's a very interesting guy. And it, it's also interesting too. Um, he and I both sh pretty much share a worldview. We've come to the same conclusions on the cosmos and evolution and human psychology and society and economics and so on and so forth. So, as a co consequence, one time he. Uh, uh, in his poetry writing class, which was the second class I'd had with him, so he knew, you know, a great deal about me at that point. Mm -hmm. But he had us, you know, give sort of our background about who we are. And so I made mention of, you know, growing up in Kentucky and going to a fundamentalist Baptist church. And my dad was a coal miner with an eighth grade education. And, you know, very much a, a contrast to Fred Turner's um, mm -hmm. background, right? Mm -hmm. And so... After I went through all that, uh, Fred leans up over the table and he's like, how on earth did the two of us come to the same conclusions? Wow. Uh, Which by the way, if I may interject, he, I, I've emailed him some time ago to send him your novella and he described you as one of the most brilliant students he's had. I don't know if I told you that, but yeah, that, that was that's quite a compliment. So <laughs> I thought that was really fine of him to say that. Um, you know, uh, but yes, and also you're a member of the Society of Classical Poets. Um, can you maybe like tell us about that organization and and uh, and what it is and how you become a member and and uh, what uh, value it is to you as a as a poet? Well, um, the Society of Classical Poets um, they emphasize uh, publishing rhyme, rhythm sort of the classical styles. Um, they also like to publish things that are founded in tradition. So um, very classical sorts of things. So 
you know, if you're writing about, you know, the ancient Greeks, yeah, they probably want to look at, you know, at your poems. Um, and not just the ancient Greeks. Um, my most recent uh, poem is titled Tradition. And the traditions that I mention are very wide ranging, not just, not just across Europe. And so, you know, I, I find them to be sort of a, a you know, a, a refreshing um, place to find more traditional, I guess you would call it mainline poetry, mm -hmm. uh, which, and what I mean by that is uh, mainline poetry is the kind of poetry that's been written in cultures across the world uh, throughout the overwhelming majority of human okay. history, um, as opposed to contemporary poem, mainstream poem mm -hmm. poetry, which is the um, avant-garde poetry, uh, free verse poetry, which is a radical break from that main line of, of poetry. Right. And so, and, and so I see myself as, as being in that main line as well. It doesn't mean that I don't deal with contemporary topics, contemporary issues, absolutely. It doesn't mean I'm not influenced by contemporary poetry, by the avant-garde and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I was very much influenced by the Surrealists, for example, they're especially there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Again, going back to Hear the Screams of the Butterfly, that might be pretty apparent in that particular work. Right. Um, Would you like to share a poem or two with us, uh, just so we get an idea of what you're, uh, what, again, what you're referring to there? If you have something prepared. Yeah, okay. I have a few poems right here. Um, uh, this first one is titled To Dance Among the Gods. The clouds have made a ladder to the moon. I must depart if I'm to get there soon. I hear the loom, the sound of sorrows sad against the hoops and howls that make me glad. I push against the fad that keeps me tied to when I'm all too often at. I bide my time and hide too little and much. I use the craggy mountain as a crutch. As fingers clutch the wispy rungs that rise as snow-topped iron, there the loom still cries while I'm the one who flies, the lunatic who listens to the moon, the voice a prick in time's quick tick that seems to slow so slow to you. I'm forced to find the beautiful and true, the morals as they grew, the just. Those four are me, as every poet knows, the door the poet opens, you implore he close. You hate the life, the light the poet chose, and as he grows, I grow. To face the fight, to dive to nature and to rise in flight, to be as gods, delight in rising up to orbit with the moon and fill our cup and sup on gold ambrosia in the shade among our equals, dreams who slowly fade. Wow. Well, that's a, interesting. I have a question on the point before you go mm -hmm. further. Uh, from my research or my findings Absolutely. about you, I noticed that uh, you love to deal with nature. Um, and I've seen that from the first line of your poem. Is this really true or is just my own perspective of your uh, what view based on what I've done on the ground as a research about you? Would you call yourself a, natural, a naturalist? Um, creative world? Uh, yeah, uh, you'll find a great deal of, of nature, nature references in my works. I, like I said, I grew up in Kentucky. I grew up in rural Kentucky. And um, back behind our house, um, well, there, there's a, a field behind our house. And, and behind that field were woods. And so with flowers. when I was young, I would go out yeah, into the woods, and I I would look at the plants and the flowers and the birds, and look at you know whatever was swimming in the stream and in the pools and and so forth. I would look at you know orchids and trilliums and um, May apple flowers and and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so you know I, I'm very much connected to nature. I, I'm I'm very much 
love and cherish nature. I, I find it um, inspiring. Um, I find it calming, um, you know, and, and, and equally I, I love, you know, I love the city as well. I love, you know, I love, you know, the, you know, people and the connections and, and, you know, everything that you can get and do in the cities. And I don't find those to be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. In fact, the more urban that humanity becomes, the more nature we'll have. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I see the things as, as, as being in balance. Excellent. Uh, and also, you ta you've taught poetry to uh, students. Did you ever find any students that you felt were instructive to you as a poet that, you know, in some way reflected you back, you know, your teachings or helped you develop as a poet? Um, I mean, mostly I taught poetry. I, I never taught like a poetry writing class per se. Mm -hmm. But when I taught um, your first year composition classes, I would have them write in you know, using certain experiments, um, which was designed to help them to, um, to think more about the words that they're using. So I, for example, I would have them write like a one page essay and they couldn't use any words with the letter E in it. Hmm. Uh, you know, and that, that's designed to slow them way down. Right. And to really think about mm -hmm. each word. Um, another thing I had them do was I, I had them write a sonnet. And, and I, you know, they had to follow the, uh, you know, very strict rules of a Shakespearean sonnet. So that it's, you know, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, right? Mm -hmm. Had to be in, exactly. And then you have, you know, iambic pentameter in each line. And the first quatrain is your introduction. And then the second is your thesis. Your mm -hmm. third is your antithesis. Mm -hmm. And then your fourth is your uh, synthesis of the idea. And I said, you have to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And when they did it, at the very worst, I would get a good poem out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming that they followed the rules, you know. Um, but every once in a while, um, and this is this is a uh, one in particular. I, I had this uh, this young man who um, he grew up on a farm. He was a farmer, and he was going to school to major in agriculture because he was going to go back and be a farmer. Okay, just straight up farm boy. He was a mm -hmm. great big guy, <laughs> and you know he. He was never, you know, really all that literary, you know, I, I don't know how much he read, but, you know, he was just a really regular standard student in, you know, in the community college where he was going to get my class, right? But he, he wrote this, he did the sonnet, and when he walked in, he handed it to me and he said, I don't know who wrote this. He's like, I, I, I've never written a poem before, but I think this is really good. And my dad thinks it's great. And I'm like, well, you know, I'll, you know, I'll take a look at it and see what, you know, what you did here. I read the thing and it was spectacular. <laughs> like it, it was just, just a beautiful, beautiful poem. And it was literally the first thing he'd ever written. And he's like, I don't know where this came mm -hmm. from. And I'm like, it came from the form. <laughs> right. Like you did a masterful job right. of, of hitting the form exactly right. But then, of course, he put his own stuff in it. And the form forced him to think in ways that he'd never thought before, to see things from a, a new perspective. And that, of course, is the wonderful thing about form, mm -hmm. that when you have to hit that rhyme, then you have to think about well, where am I really going with this? Um, and if it's not fitting, then you have to rethink the line and, and try to fit it into that rhythm and, and that rhyme. And when you do that, sometimes you come up with something way more brilliant than you are. Yeah, and true. this is exactly what happened with him. 
that wow. he, he, he came up with a poem that he's like, this is this is more brilliant than than I am than I am than I could ever imagine myself to be. <laughs> that's why he said, I don't know who wrote this. <laughs> Wow, and that's that thing, you know, to say. It was like a spiritual intervention of sorts. You know, your unconscious mind is just, you know, flows into it, and you know, it just happens sometimes. You know, exactly. Yeah. You know, like, would you like uh, to read an, another piece for us? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, the next one. This one is called Guide Light. In the blue is the moon a milk mass whose place is purple dawn, a pregnant betrayal of time and expectation when the sun is supposed to be set in the sapphire, alone to light our lives. Who's she who will be so free beside the sun? Why won't she run? I thought the dark was destined to draw me through my life, to thread and to threaten in ceaseless new moon nights that would nudge me graveward and grant me a gravity that death couldn't strangle out of me. Still the steel reveal the wheel that turned my life from death's blue knife. But the moon that is doubling the day will dip into the night enough so that nothing is encompassed by the dark that has come to claim my mind. She will mend my heart and move me to the dawn so the devils will dance the lance and trance me to the day where I can stay. Wow. I definitely see the surrealist influences in that one. <laughs> right? <laughs> definitely feel that. Yeah, there's, there's some deep, deep currents there. Um, so, uh, I mean, as far as the academics, I mean, uh, how, how did you shift? What, what made you shift from studying biology into into writing i mean was there a moment when you're just like you know i just don't want to do that i want to just move on to something new well there was a couple of things um for one i i had always written um i when i was like 12 years old i i began writing a novel naturally it's about as good as one could expect from a 12 year old mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> but you know so that impetus to write was there you know mm -hmm. and but you know, I was also very interested in science, especially biology. And so that's the direction I ended up going. And, and in high school too, I had an excellent biology and chemistry uh, teacher. And so he, that also then encouraged me to go in that particular direction, right? And, but then I went to college and, and again, I was doing the molecular biology stuff. I got into a lab right away um, as a freshman, in fact, but I, you know, you have the, these, you know, required courses, these classes that, you know, you know, you have to take and let me get this stupid thing out of my way. Mm -hmm. And so one of the stupid things I was getting out of my way was an introduction to philosophy course uh, with somebody by the name of Ronald Nash. And, you know, how often do you remember the names of, you know, the required course professors? <laughs> <laughs> that should tell you how important this class was because he introduced me to, to Plato, which you know, in and of itself wouldn't have done much of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also had two books that he had written that we, that we discussed, uh, one of which was uh, called uh, Faith and Reason, uh, which was about uh, Christianity and, and reason. And the other one was called Poverty and Wealth, um, a Christian defense of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this book, got me really excited about reading economics. And so I went to the library and read everything I could find on economics, uh, which included this little book titled um, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal uh, by some woman by the name of Ayn Rand, <laughs> who kept referencing this novel uh, called Atlas Shrugged. And so I'm like, well, let me look into this. And that book got me into the idea that I could write fiction with ideas. Mm. Like, you know, th that's what she was doing. She was using this, this work to present ideas, was doing it, you know, using fiction, using characters, but there's just that idea that I could, I could write 
stories you, with with ideas as, as being important and being at the center. Right. You know, and and I read I read her stuff. I read her philo philosophical stuff. Um, and probably the most important thing that happened with her, other than deciding that I could write using ideas, was that she led me to Goethe, to Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. to Victor Hugo, yeah. um, and to Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly, uh, yeah, Nietzsche in particular um, really got my attention, got my enthusiasm. Um, and and I, I, li I like to say that, um, that Nietzsche you know, threw me into the abyss <laughs> and, and then threw the rope <laughs> down after he helped pull me back out. So he, he's responsible for both, I think, uh, and, and in a very good way, you know. Yeah, he's and quite so, a thinker. Quite a thinker. Yeah, exactly. Very, very and so counterintuitive. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and and Nietzsche's Nietzsche's philosophy is is also all over here. The streams of the butterfly as well. Yes, beyond nature. And I so, have a question. Beyond nature, you also have the concept of spirituality in most yes. of your writings. What pushed you to consider this in your writing? Is it your background or what? Well, I mean. In part, because like I said, I, I was raised a fundamentalist Baptist. Um, and we, you know, we were taught to be, you know, that Christianism was true and therefore evolution was false and that the Big Bang Theory was false and so on and so forth. And, you know, it took me a couple of years to, to get educated out of that idea. But it was a very interesting sort of thing though. I had a lot of friends who started the same Pro, in the same program at the same time as me, and they were all from Kentucky, and they were all Christians, and they all became atheists, mm. you know, with sufficient introduction to, you know, the facts of evolution. But I didn't, um, because one thing that I was always able to do was understand that the pastor's interpretation of a text is his interpretation of the text. That it, it the end all be all. That there are other ways to understand a text. I don't know where this came from in me, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I I had that understanding. I that okay. Well, this is how you see it, and maybe we can see it in another way, and still believe that Jesus is our Messiah. <laughs> um, and so for me then, I, I, I was able to maintain this, you know, belief in God along with an understanding of uh, that evolution was true, that the Big Bang was true. It was thoroughly possible that this is how God did it. And that, mm -hmm. that it, in, in Genesis, that understanding of what is going on is very is metaphorical and is expressed in such a way that a tribal group of people living in a desert might get what's might understand it you know right and so you know so that was an aspect of it as well and and of course and as my you know as, as I've learned more, as I've gotten into things like mythology, as I've come to understand um, human psychology and, and the relationship of human psychology to, to, to society and, and evolving you know, social systems, you know, I've, I've come to see there's sort of a, a spiritual aspect even to that. And that, that to, to truly sort of understand who we are, we have to understand that spiritual side of ourselves. And to and, and we also have to sort of give credit where credit is due. You know, is it possible that, you know, one religion has all of 
the truth, all of the facts? It's possible. But we're, what about all these other billions of people? They believe many other things. What, what does that mean? You know, well, well one way to, to maybe look at it is to understand that um, all of these religions are tap, getting into some, they're tapping into something. Right. They're, they're getting aspects of God sort of in, in the same way as that story of the seven blind men and the elephant, right? Where, you know, one is feeling a, a tree trunk, one is feeling a wall, one is feeling a rope, one's feeling a hose, one's feeling a, a sack, one's feeling a spear. And, you know, how do you put that together? You know, traditionally humans have just thought about it, right? Um, another option though, is to put it together in such a way that you get something as weird and wonderful as an elephant. And maybe God is that weird and wonderful. Mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, and and so and so yeah, I, I bring that sort of thing into my poetry as well. That that yeah, there's this this spiritual aspect to it, um, where you sort of see that you know this the spirit within things and and across things and above and you know through things and above things. And that you know, it's all imbued with 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 spirit of a sort. And and so, in the final word here, I wonder if you have any particular writers or, or literary influences you'd like to share with the audience to maybe for them to check out something uh, of their own if they wanted to get to know a little bit more about literature. Well, I mean, my own personal influences as far as. Uh, poetry goes, I mean, I'd obviously have to mention Fred Turner. Mm -hmm. um, um, I also, um, I'm a big fan of Wallace Stevens. Mm -hmm. I think he does an excellent job of, of you know, poetizing ideas. Um, I love uh, many of the romantics. I love Coleridge. I love Keats. Um, I am a big fan of, uh, of Blake. And um, and so you know th those those are many of the the poets that I, I most particularly uh, get drawn to mm -hmm. and and return to again and again. So right? in twenty seconds, what um, message do you have for our viewers at home? What advice would you like to give to um, people who believe that poetry is their way, but they don't know the way to get into poetry? Well, my recommendation is to find find what you like, find what is interesting to you, find what you love. You know, I, I met to poetry in, in an odd sort of way. I I read somewhere that um, fiction, you know, prose writers should write try to write poetry to sort of tighten up their style, and so I thought that was an excellent idea. And so I I played around with that and I did that, and I wasn't really that into poetry at first until I really started writing it. Well, and then as we, I wrote more and more, we, we, I read we will poetry have to end and, the show here. We sincerely appreciate uh, Troy uh, company for your time. Our, our viewers must have learned a lot, especially in the area of uh, poetry, academic parts and the even convention, non-conventional aspects. So thank you, we appreciate your time. Uh, Dustin, we appreciate you for your daily commitments. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll keep coming with new things every day. Thank you so much. We hope to have unique. Um